Hey guys, welcome back to Bungus Custom Bikes. Uh, today we're going to be doing something a little different. We focused a lot on repair and stuff like that. Today we're going to talk, be talking about fabricating. Before we start, I want to show everyone my new bald head cover. That is a custom hat made by Mouth Sweater Manufacturing here in Virginia. They are an awesome company. Uh, a couple co-workers of mine, uh, fellow firefighters, go check them out. They make some really cool stuff. But anyways, so what we got here is what's left of a 1979 XS 1100. Uh, building this up for a good friend of mine. Um, he basically is, he wants something different. The bike's been handed down throughout uh, the years from his father to him. Now it's going to go to his son. And he wants something a little different. So this bike comes stock as a normal cruiser. It's got a sprung rear end. Uh, it's an 1100 uh, cc engine, as you can see back here in the corner. That's going to be not totally taken apart because it's still got good compression. Uh, it turns over fine. So far, I've cleaned it, but the backstory of this bike, it was actually in a fire. So he was riding it one day. Something happened with the carburetors. They uh, probably leaked fuel on something hot, and it lit off underneath his butt. So all the wiring was burnt through. A lot of the plastics were melted. A lot of the rubbers were melted. So he asked that I kind of do a resto mod on it. So after consulting with him for a little bit, he decided that he wanted to go with a hardtail. So today we're going to be talking about the fabrication involved in building a hardtail. And a lot of that fabrication is kind of the same, whether you're building um, a seat perch for a cafe racer, whether you're converting a bike to a hardtail, or really whatever you're doing, the same fabrication skills carry throughout. So. Like I said, today we're going to be talking about fabrication. So in getting on with fabrication, to give the backstory of what we've done so far, like I mentioned, the bike came with rear suspension, a full frame that came all the way over the back wheel, and a fender. I've since cut all that off, so that's really the only part you've missed so far. So the fender or the frame extended from here back to here and then came down to these uprights. Um, I'm going to use these uprights to support the frame as it comes down. And I don't know if you can see, but these bushings right here were originally where the shocks mounted. So if you spin it around, you can see where I actually cut it off the bottom of the shock. I'm going to use that as a bung to weld the new frame too and the reason i want it to be detachable is because this motorcycle is shaft driven so really the only way to get that wheel assembly off is to take the differential off on this other side here and if it's welded to the frame you're never gonna be able to take that wheel off so i need to be able to take the wheel and the swing arm off the bike while obviously leaving the frame on. So it's still gonna have an articulating swing arm, however the frame is gonna come down and just hold it all rigid. Um, then again, if you ever want to or need to change the tire, you just pull these bolts where the shocks would have mounted and you can pull the whole assembly out still. So in going with fabrication, you always wanna match the steel that's being used in the frame. So in this case, I'm not sure exactly what kind of steel it is. It's probably not DOM. It's probably a CREW, which is cold, ro cold rolled electric welded um, tubing. But you always want to match or exceed the diameter of the tube. So this is one inch tube by eighth inch wall. Um, it's, it's Japanese bike, so it's all metric, but that's kind of what it comes out close to. So I went out and got some DOM tubing which I like to use a little more, and that's what this is here. This is DOM, as you can see, it's, it's pretty thick. Um, and you always want to use strong, good steel for structural members. Um, I like to use conduit to mock things up. So this is just electric conduit, you know, pretty thin-walled. You find it at Lowe's, Home Depot, anything like that. Uh, it's lightweight, it's cheap. So I can use this to cut to size, bend wherever I want it to. It still welds. So I like to use this for mock-up on fabrication. Um, so, you know, in this instance, I could take it and say, okay, well, I need to come off here and come down and I can bend it wherever I need to. I can even throw some tack welds on it to 
really truly mock it up. The difference is that DOM is very expensive. I want to say for 60 inches of that one inch by eighth wall DOM, it was close to $250. So DOM and structural steel is very expensive right now. Steel prices fluctuate with the market. It's out of this world right now. This stuff is like $10 for 10 feet. So you can't beat it. You get a big, nice long stick of it, and I've got a good long stick over there still. And you can cut it, you can mess it up. You know, you cut it two inches too short, darn. You throw that away and you grab more of your stick. It's just kind of the cost of doing business. It's cheap, it's usable. So I like to use it for mock-up. So essentially what we're gonna do here is to fabricate this frame. We know that we need to come from this bung, meet this center tube, and then come to this top end and do that on both sides. So the reason I kept this is anytime you're doing any kind of fabricating or anything that's going to support structures, you want triangles. So triangles geometrically, failed geometry in high school, but I know some things. Triangles geometrically are the strongest shape. Um, so you always want triangles. So in doing that, you know, we're coming off here and you see we've got a triangle right here. And then from this bar down to this one, we've got another triangle. Also, this will be supporting the center of that weight, where eventually as I get further into this build, we're gonna have a fender come up and over the wheel that will support the back of the seat. So I want a lot of support right here because that's what's gonna support the fender. And also, because it's still an articulating swing arm, we're not getting any support from the bottom. So we need as much structural support on this section of the frame as we can get. When the rider wants to go over a bump, or does inevitably go over a bump, that shock from the wheel is still going to want to move that swing arm. So we need to make sure that anything that's supporting that upwards motion is strong. So that the welds don't break and the bike falls apart. That would be very bad. So another thing to keep in mind is the different types of welds that you're going to do in fabricating. So we've got two different joints that we're going to do here. I'm probably not going to say what they're actually called. The welders, y'all can, uh, can correct me and tell me I'm wrong. But this I like to call a butt joint because there's one tube butting up to another tube. You're gonna weld the entire circumference of this bottom tube to this top tube. And then here is pretty much the same thing. It's just another butt joint coming down to this. Now this one up here is gonna be a little different because if you just put it on here, get my hands out of the way, and weld this tube to this tube, I guess that's technically considered a butt joint, but I don't know. If you weld this tube to this tube, the only thing holding that there is your weld. So we're gonna get good welds, but over time, you know, welds fatigue, they, uh, they don't stretch, but they'll fatigue over time, rust can get into them, anything like that. And you really don't want your weld being the only thing that's supporting that tube. So what we need to do is we need to put a, I call it a plug, it could be called a bung, uh, an insert, anything like that. But we essentially want to put something in it. This is just a punch. This is not what we're going to use. This is going to go in there. The tube slides over it. And then that will support that joint. That plug will be welded to both the inside of this tube and the inside of this tube through a rosette weld. And then we're also going to weld the circumference of the tube in that gap. So there's a lot more surface area that's being welded and holding that together, and that'll ensure that structural integrity of that joint. Um, it'd be a lot stronger if I could kind of just butt it up on top like that, but that looks like crap. So that is probably one of the more important parts of doing something like this. Um, the other thing that we need to think about with surface area welds, and this is again, anytime you're doing any kind of welding on tubes, is you don't ever want to have round going to round. So what I mean by that is you take this tube and you just stick it on top, right? Yes, we could weld that, but if you see all that gap in here. So what you want to do is you want to do what's called a fish mouth. And you can use that with a tube notcher. I think it'd be found pretty cheap from Harbor Freight, anywhere like that. So that eventually you come out with something like that. So if you see with that curve, that fits much better onto that tube. And then that's a lot more surface area that can be welded. 
and it'll hold that much stronger. So those are the fundamentals of how we're gonna do this and kind of the fundamentals of building and fabricating. Uh, the tools you need to really get into fabricating, you're gonna need some kind of angle finder, whether it's a protractor or something simple like this. I like these. They just kind of uh, articulate and move and tell you what your angles are. Um, angles are important because you don't want to just start bending tube willy-nilly and then you get down to it and you find like oh the other side is at 140 degrees and this side's at 120 it's not gonna match so I like to have a good angle finder obviously a sharpie or some kind of uh, metal etching tool they have those carbide uh, pencils that etch into steel um, to mark where you're gonna bend where you're gonna cut um, you can make measurements on the steel by writing them so any kind of writing instrument a good welder, a good set of welding skills. I'm by no means a professional welder, but I've been doing it for quite a few years now that I probably consider myself a hobbyist. Um, if you don't know how to weld, I would find somebody who does. Um, you don't want to go fabricating frame members and frame sections if you don't know how to weld, because if you're not getting good welds, those sections and those members will break. And in something like this, where it's holding that swing arm from swinging, it could be catastrophic. So definitely take your time, practice welding, learn how to weld. Um, I'll make a different video another day on welding skills, but definitely take your time and learn how to weld or find someone who does who can help you. On top of that, you got your angle finder, um, some kind of something to measure, tape measure, ruler, yardstick, uh, the old finger method. No, I don't use that. And then patience, lots and lots and lots of patience. Um, you're gonna mess up, you're gonna cut steel too short, you're gonna overbend, underbend, lots of patience. Um, it's, some people call it an art. I wouldn't really call it an art because I'm by no means an artist, but there is a lot that goes into it. So without further ado, let's start working on it. So first things first, I wanna figure out how to get from here to here and connect all that together. Um, and hopefully I cut this right and this won't need to be cut any lower or higher. Lower we can deal with, higher we don't wanna do because obviously you can't really add steel back once you cut it. So I've got my stick of conduit here. Like I said, I like using this rather than the DOM until I know that the shape is gonna match because the DOM is very expensive. So what we'll start with is just measuring the gap. We got my handy dandy tape measure, and we're basically just gonna measure from here down to this bung. And you see, I'm already hitting this, and that's okay because I think I wanna put a little bit of a bend right here. So it's gonna bend and then come down. I think that looks a little sleeker than just a flat tube that goes straight into a diagonal. So we're gonna skip that one and then come down to here. So I'm getting 19 and a half inches. So that's how long it would be without any kind of bend. If it was just straight, coming just like this, boop, boop, and I'll come on the outside of it. Boop, boop, just like that, that would be 19 and a half inches. And as you can see, without looking at this part up here, it's just not really sleek straight down like that. It's easy to do like that, but we want this to look good. And also, thinking ahead in the project, we know that we're gonna have a seat here, and we don't want that seat at this angle so you're looking at the sky while you're riding. So I think a little bit of a bend there would uh, would look a little better. And for demonstration purposes, I've already mocked this up. I'm still gonna show you how we do it. I've already mocked this up. And this is what I've come up with for that piece. So this is just that same conduit that I've already gone and bent. And as you can see, that there looks a lot better. It's got this nice flat piece up top here that the seat can rest on, and then it drops down to the swing arm. So that's ultimately what I'm going to use is that shape. Now I'll show you how we kind of get to that. And to be completely honest, it's, it's kind of trial. I mean, you can take a guess at what you want to bend and take a couple different pieces. Like, for example, I could take uh, this shorter piece of straight conduit. It's crimped there, so we're not going to use it for anything. But like I said, conduit kind of just trash steel. Uh, you get enough of it, you can bring it to the scrap yard and get your money back. 
So what we'll do is we'll take this longer piece, we'll set that on the ground and then set it up to here. And we'll kind of follow the angle of what this T intersection is gonna be. And then we'll kind of come straight off here, just like that. And you know what, you can't see, let me change your angle here. So yeah, so we matched where this bung is down here and we're gonna come straight off this tube and match that. And then all we gotta do is measure this angle, which we will do right now. You gotta actually get your angle right. All right. And that comes out to be about 135 degrees. So then what we can do from there is take our conduit and you always want to go long we measured i think it was 20 and something inches yeah 20 and a half inches for that you always want to go a little long so i like to go about 10 inches over so i'm going to cut a piece that's 30 inches long and then i'll bend that 135 degrees into it and in doing that, you end up with a piece like this that's just got, you know, 10 inches sticking off the bottom like so. So then what we'll do is we'll uh, get that bent up, end up with this piece, which you can see here, is right at 135 degrees. And then you're gonna end up with it being a little longer. So then you can come in here with your bend and kind of just go past this bolt and it'll just stick off the bottom. So once it's sticking off the bottom like that, once it's sticking off the bottom like that, that's when you take your Sharpie, mark that line, again, cut it a little long. You take it, bring it over into your vise and you use a tube notcher cut your fish mouth into it. And you see it kind of looks like a little fish mouth. And then that will fit perfectly right there on that bone, just like that. So all that being said, you know, we went ahead, got all that measured. The uh, conduit piece that we made fits beautifully. So then we've got our upright. So then all we're gonna do is take this conduit piece and match it up with our DOM. So here's the piece that's actually cut out of DOM. It's got the fish mouth on the bottom, flat on the top to meet up with this piece up here, and conduit, DOM, and you just make a match. And again, you don't really wanna cut your DOM until you know that this works. Because again, this is cheap. So had I over bent it, I just get another piece and bend it again. This, if I overbend it, this piece is trashed. I can cut it up and use it for scraps for other things, but that's a lot of money wasted. So I always like to do it in disposable material first. And then all you're gonna do is repeat that same process for the other side. So that piece fits right there. And then after repeating the process for the other side, I've got my other piece that fits just like that. Now going back to structural integrity, this is fine. This will support the bike beautifully once I get the plugs in here on both sides. However, there's nothing to support right here in the middle. Eventually that seat's just going to sink through or it's going to want to spread apart. So you always want some kind of cross beam. And that's where this little guy comes in. So I'm not going to put it on now or if these pieces will fall, but that's going to sit right here in the middle. And what that'll do is it kind of just holds the whole structure together and that'll get welded. Now, going back to having the tubing cut, this has fish mounts on both sides to fit the radius of these tubes. 
give a good surface area to weld on, make a stronger uh, joint. So let me get some uh, cleaning done and we'll get some plugs fabricated and I'll get back to you. Thank you. All right, we got our plug welds. I believe those are actually called rosette welds. Uh, again, welders, if you're watching, please don't kill me. Plug, rosette, not sure. So all it is, is you see I've got the plug that I was talking about there. It just slid into the pipe. And then I drilled a hole in the DOM and just welded that hole. It's not structural, it's just holding that plug from sliding back and forth and it's also holding it firm against the tube. So then, all you do, you see I've already got this one in, it's not welded, but you just slide it into the frame, kind of locks into place there, get a position where you want it, and it's important, very important, that you have everything squared up where you want it. So whether you need to use like a magnetic square like this to hold it in place, it's just a magnet with some steel on the side, it'll uh, you know stick to the steel and then you slide it into position. Make sure everything is exactly where you want it because our next step is going to be to actually start welding this to the motorcycle. I like to start with just tack welds, so just kind of little like pop, pop, little tiny welds. They're not structural by any means. It's kind of like putting Elmer's glue on it. It's just going to hold it where I want it so I can get everything mocked up. They're easy to cut. They're easy to break. So if it's not right, you just break that tack weld, grind it off, do it again. But we like to get things done right the first time, right? So 
I get my magnet on, get it all held in place, look at all my joints, this one's good. This one's good up here, so the next step would be to weld the plug in the frame, and then actually weld that circumference of that joint, and then kind of just go down with them and weld them all in. Um, again, we're only gonna do tack welds from, for now. Um, then the next step would be come to the other side, weld this other upright on. So that's gonna go right in there, and then that one will swing into place. That was a little bit of a, a little bit of a tighter interference fit, which I like, but it fits well. So, you know, we got both sides in now, and then the last step would be to put our little cross member in, and you know, that's going to go here. And look at that! I didn't measure right, and that is too short, and I didn't make it out of uh, the conduit. So, fortunately, I still have one more little piece of DOM, and that's all I got left. So that's a wasted piece, and this is why I say always, well first of all, you know the old saying, measure twice, cut once, buy once, cry once, because I don't want to buy this again. Um, obviously I'm running on the customer's money here, but you know I'm not trying to spend any more money than needed. My mistake, my money. So we'll measure this again, and I'll cut that, but for now, we'll get all these tacked into place, and we'll go from there. One thing I forgot to mention uh, is all these pieces that are painted need to be grinded clean. Uh, if you weld over paint, you're going to get porosity in your welds and then it's like, uh, it's like styrofoam. It's not a good weld. So I'll get the grinding disc, clean all that paint off. It can also be done with just sandpaper or anything like that. It doesn't need to be grinded, grinded. Just the paint, any oil, contaminants, all that needs to come off. Uh, one could even go as far as to clean the DOM, because this is just mill scale on the DOM. Uh, it's not rust, it's not oxidation, it's just kind of, you know, the, the steel. But you can even grind that steel to a nice clean finish, and your welds will be chef's kiss. Uh, clean steel is a clean weld. So we'll get on that too. So I've got a little, a little bit of prep work before we actually start welding. Uh, half of welding is preparation.
All right, now we got everything dry fit. It's clean. We're gonna change it to welding PPE. So we're gonna lose the clear safety glass. Let's put on a welding hood, some welding gloves, and let's get to burning. All right, so tack welds are done on these, and I probably should have done these before I measured the little cross member there. That way I don't, you know, have wibble movement. I've got the frame sections where I want them, so now I'll measure for that cross piece. Obviously it's going in between, so I kind of want it right above this bend. So I'm looking at six and... Six and seven eighths. Fortunately, metal's a little forgiving than wood. You cut it too long, you shave a little off. You cut it too short, it's too short. But so let's see. Where's the other piece that did not fit? Let's see how far off I was. There she is. So when you're measuring things with fish mouths or you know these little notches for the tubing, you always want to measure from the inside of the fish mouth because that's where it's actually going to make contact with the outermost part or the innermost part of the tube. So we'll measure that and come down. And I'm an eighth of an inch off. So close, no cigar, too short. So basically all we're gonna do is we're gonna cut another one out of this piece here. And what I'm gonna do is because the inside diameter is six and seven eighths, I'm gonna take it over to the tube notcher notch just the end off to get that round bevel and then like I said I'm going to measure from the inside of the bevel down to six and seven eighths make another mark and that mark should be the outside of where your hole saw is going to cut into that and that will give you the proper length you don't ever want to cut from the wide part of the bevel because then you'll be too long um, it's also important to note it kind of sounds intuitive it's important to note that when you put it in your hole saw uh, jig or your uh, tube notcher jig that you're setting it up right so if you cut one going in this direction you want to make sure you don't actually set it up to cut the other one going in that direction or it's, unless that's what you're trying to do but in this case it's not what I want so that way you can make sure that both of your bevels end up facing the right way all right so with a little movie magic got a new piece cut and now before I tack it in I want to make sure that it is not crooked 
I want to make sure that it's perpendicular to the existing frame. The way we're going to do that is measure both sides. So all I'm looking is I want to use a reference point that I haven't built. That way I know it's there because, you know, I kind of cut the frame willy-nilly, whatever. So I'm going to measure from this crossbar here where the fuel tank mounts down to my new crossbar. So we're going to take a measurement here. And I've got four and three quarters. And then we're going to take a measurement here. And I'm just over four and three quarters there. So I know I need to move it down some. Now, before I weld it, I'm going to take my Sharpie and mark four and three quarters on each side. That way I can just butt it up to my line, tack it in, and we're golden. So I'll take that back out. Find my Sharpie. And now, like I said, we're looking for four and three quarters. Come up here. And mark four and three quarters. And then the same on this side. Come up here and mark four and three quarters. So now I've got my two lines that I know I can set that up to. And I'm going to use my little magnets to hold it in while I weld it so it doesn't move. These are like five bucks at any welding supply store. You don't have to get the fancy ones. They've got some that, you know, you can turn the magnet on and off. I guess the ones where you can turn the magnet on and off are cool because I don't know if you can see it, all the hair on it. Let me get my face out of the way. That's just metal shavings that get stuck on the magnet. Just wipe them off. So we'll get that one set there. And where's my big red one? I swear I lose stuff more than I find stuff in this shop. All right, so I got it all jigged up with my magnet. So now we're gonna tack it in. I like the right side on. I did have the right side on. Okay. All right, so got everything tacked up. Everything's kind of where I want it to be. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and finish weld everything as I kind of move along with the product. I'm probably gonna leave it tacked just for a bit while I mock up the fender and everything like that. Um, it all still kind of goes along with fabricating. But basically as I put that fender on, that's gonna be the last kind of structural member of the bike. Uh, a fender is obviously not structural, but the sissy bar that's gonna be holding the fender up and as well as the mount down here on the bottom of the swing arm will be structural to the fender so as i get all that mounted up get the battery box installed all the rest of the fabrication that goes along with converting a bike um that's what i'll probably go through at the end and start finish welding everything but i hope this video helped um, i know it wasn't a lot of information on fabricating just kind of a quick crash course but it should get you the basics of measuring cutting uh, didn't really talk too much on the process of welding, but I will make a video later on about 
uh, some basic entry level welding. Uh, I'm an entry level welder, so. But yeah, stick with me, stay tuned. Thanks for checking out my videos. Uh, I'm gonna try and get a little bit better about posting more videos more often. Um, I'm not in the shop as much as I'd like to be, but I will keep posting videos. So thanks for checking out Bungus Custom Bikes. Stay riding.